This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international programme of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Hi, Duncan Barrett, Trek FM. This is a question for Marina. Um, we recently been talking a lot about mental health because it's been Mental Health Week and I think the conversation on mental health has moved on a lot over the years but in the 80s when Next Gen was debuting it was quite a radical thing to have a, a mental health professional on the bridge of the Starship. Did you see that as a kind of responsibility in any way performing that role? I mean, did that seem like a big deal to you at the time? Uh, it didn't, actually. Um, I did have the conversation with Gene Wonderberry about it and he, his, uh, he felt that by the 24th century, mental health would be as important as physical health. But then when it came to, he felt he had too many women on the show and one of us had to go, <laughs> it was going to be me. Because, you know, it was like, well, we've got, you know, we need a doctor, we need a security chief, but if we've got to get rid of one of the girls, we'll, we'll lose the psychologist, you know. So, um, he had good intentions, but when push came to shove, mm. it was like, well, you know, she can go. So it was, it was groundbreaking. I mean, I, I, I have been watching, I've been here since Tuesday, and I have been watching a lot of the stuff about mental health. The wonderful thing about it is that people talk about it now. Um, people talk, you know, people aren't embarrassed to say, well, yes, I've had a difficult time. I had to be on antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs or whatever for a while. Um, which is good because I, I, I've had mental health issues in my life and I've had to go on medication. Um, and when it first happened, you feel that there was such a stigma that you felt that you were mad, that there was something seriously wrong with you. And basically, it's a chemical imbalance. And, um, you know, if you were diabetic, you wouldn't think twice about taking your insulin every day, would you? But with, with anything to do with the brain, people get really funny about it. So um, it's a really good place that we're at now that we can talk about it. I have to say, in America, it's not there yet. So I'm really glad that in England we're, we're speaking up about it because no one's life is perfect. And, Everyone might need it. A lot of people might need a little bit of help to get through certain situations in life, and it shouldn't be something that we're ashamed of. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. Your hosts are Clara Cook and Duncan Barrett. Welcome back to part two of our mental health episode. In this episode, we cover mental health in Star Trek Next Generation Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and we briefly touch on Star Trek Enterprise. But maybe we should move on in that case and and talk about kind of moving into the 24th century and moving into, of course, with the next generation, which was the series famously, which put a counsellor on the bridge of the starship, you know, and this was the 1980s. This was a big move. A lot of people found it bizarre at the time and, you know, subsequently. But it was obviously a kind of statement of intent to try and say that mental health was important, to say that realistically, you you know, if you're dealing with a ship with a thousand people on board, you know, yes, you need a doctor, you're also going to need a counsellor, you're going to need someone to deal with the fallout of these kind of experiences that people are going through. On the other hand, of course, 
arguably Troy as a character was not well served by the writers. It sort of feels like with Next Gen, there's almost there's this ideal that they're trying to kind of live up to that, you know, yes, we should take our mental health seriously and that's important. But at the same time, often, not always, you know, there are good examples of, of Troy doing a job effectively and good examples of stories that deal with mental health in Next Gen. But quite often it felt like this was a character that they didn't really know what to do with. And I think there was also this kind of a sort of ambivalence, even, you know, say coming from Gene Roddenberry, where, you know, we've heard these stories about Gene Roddenberry saying, oh, you, you know, people shouldn't be grieving their losses. You know, we've kind of humanity's evolved to the point that we're not going to be really affected by these these kind of things in the same way where these kind of evolved human beings. We've almost transcended that kind of, those sort of you know, that kind of gut emotional response, that kind of distress in a way that we kind of move beyond that. Yet at the same time, you put a counsellor on the ship and there's this kind of weird mismatch in Next Gen, I think, between these two kind of these these two kind of ideas somehow that mental health is really important, but at the same time we're not going to get too sort of dark and gritty with it. It's gonna be it's gonna be kept within quite safe boundaries somehow. Yeah, and I also think that would be a really hard thing for human humanity to ever achieve because in terms of losses, some of the losses that happen in the next generation, especially in the case of that little boy, you know, who models himself on on data, like he's lost his parents. I mean, how are people ever supposed to be able to sort of just get over the loss of their parents? You know, or or in the case of Crusher, she's lost her husband. How is anyone supposed to just get over the... Or Wesley's lost his father. Do you know what I mean? Like, how are you... Sp- I, I, human beings love their families. There's, that's kind of the way we're made and it's actually the way we're supposed to be. So the idea that you could just, that, that bereavement wouldn't affect you. I think that's my big, I mean, I'm going back to it again, but that's my big bugbear with Star Trek is that I don't, I don't think it portrays bereavement accurately, which I think is a real shame, especially because so many people die in Star Trek for the future, for a, utop- a utopian future. It's actually, not that safe. Although we're talking about people in space and I suppose space is never safe, but that's my big bugbear with Star Trek really in terms of mental health is I don't think it betrays bereavement very realistically. So I'm very conflicted about Troy and obviously at the beginning of this podcast, I rubbished her a little bit. Sorry, Amy, but I, I feel it's not really Troy's fault. And in some cases she does actually prove to be very useful. There's that episode I think it's schisms. It's schisms where she helps the, she helps members of the crew sort of recall memories in the holodeck to discover that they've been experimented on while they're asleep. You know, so she has, she does have like sort of psychological tools available to her to support and help people. But I think in terms of dealing with people who are going through some sort of mental trauma, I'm not sure she's actually that effective. And I don't think that's Troy's fault. I don't think that's the actress's fault. I think it's the fact that Troy was a character to serve several purposes. And I think the primary purpose, her her primary purpose wasn't actually to be a counsellor in terms of her characterization. She was there, number one, to look beautiful. Number two, to be you know, have some sort of relationship with Riker. Number three, to sort of state obvious emotional points in stories, you know, and she, and also sometimes she's there just to almost like be a, an object that the main characters can like bounce their ideas off. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes I think in some episodes you could replace Troy with, it sounds awful, but like a chair (laughs) <laughs> and you get the same reaction. Like she doesn't actually really always say that much, especially sometimes when she's talking to Picard or, or Picard is talking to her. I sometimes feel like he could be talking to his cup of Earl Grey. But you um, could say that that's a kind of classic sort of Freudian analyst role where, you know, you have the counsellor who doesn't really say anything and just repeats things back at you. But that's she, not she a counsellor though, of that. is it? <laughs> I mean, maybe people, <laughs> I would, mean. Just, maybe, maybe people listening to this podcast would disagree with me. I mean, what would you deem to be a counsellor? I would say the sort of Freudian, like, sort of mental health professional would be someone that would sit there and listen and make notes. But... I mean, counsellors are supposed to listen, but they're also supposed to counsel you as well, aren't they? I mean, I've seen counsellors and I've never found counsellors actually that helpful. Sorry, Troy. Uh, <laughs> in, my, in my experience, I've always found a psychotherapist more useful. But a lot of people do find counsellors really supportive and really helpful. And I'm I'm not sure I'm seeing a huge amount of that from Troy. And I do, but I don't think it's her fault. I mean, like I'm talking like she's a real person. But... I think it's it's the way, it's the fact that she was supposed to be many different things in in, in next generation. She was supposed to fulfil many different areas, and count 
they didn't maybe use her enough as a counsellor. I feel like Guinan is more of a counsellor. Guinan has Guinan sort of has more insight into people somehow, weirdly, than Troy, even though Troy can read their emotions. It's Guinan who kind of picks d- does exactly what you might expect a a kind of therapist to do in some ways, picking up on things that people aren't quite saying or aren't quite expressing. Do you know what I mean? Teasing something out from someone and and being quite kind of canny around it. Whereas Troy seems sort of more straightforward. Weirdly, I feel like probably one of the best episodes of Troy actually functioning as a counsellor is a Voyager episode. And I can't even remember the the name of it, but it's one of the ones where there's Troy and Barclay in the Alpha Quadrant. And um, there's a scene in that where Barclay has this girlfriend and there's he has some kind of ambivalence or uncertainty around it and basically and Troy does a brilliant job of through a combination of a kind of traditional sort of you know talking therapy with Barclay and also using her empathic powers to sort of understand how he's feeling of actually kind of deducing something that he's not really aware of but that unconsciously he's aware I think his girlfriend turns out to be a spy or something. I can't even remember what the storyline is. She's working for Ferengi or something. But it's actually an example where Troy seems to be very competent at both those things, both at using her kind of empathic power, but also just at doing the kind of day job of of working as a therapist. And she does a really good job of it. And it all kind of makes sense. And it sort of made me realise watching that, how often on Next Gen, she doesn't seem very... We're given to understand she's quite a highly qualified, professionalised sort of individual, but often it maybe doesn't feel very much like that. And it probably doesn't help that they put her in the kind of, you know, ridiculous outfits and, and so on that, that that tend not to take her all that seriously. But I also think there's an element that when we see Troy helping people with their mental health, it's typically, we often see her helping children, for example. She does deal with a fair bit of bereavement, but often it's children that she's dealing with. And I think maybe in some ways that's sort of, there's an element of the kind of status involved. You know, yes, we do see her help Picard a bit with his kind of, with the fallout of being assimilated by the Borg and so on. You know, we do get a sense that she kind of advises him. We see in Generations, actually, when he loses his brother and his nephew, I think she functions very well as a counsellor in that scene where she, you know, she has that wonderful line where he says, oh, it's all right, counsellor. And she said, no, Captain, it's not all right. Which I think, I think for me, that's the best scene in that whole film, actually. A really beautiful scene, really well played by both those actors, you know, Patrick Stewart giving this really emotional performance, but actually Marina Sirtis really kind of grounding it and giving this sense of someone who who does understand how to be there for someone who understands sort of what to do in that situation. And, it, you know, and when to provide solace and when to challenge what the other person is saying as well. But I think often in Next Gen, you know, we see her dealing with kids who are these kind of low status characters in a way. We see her dealing with someone like Barclay, who's also a bit of a low status character. We don't see her giving all that much kind of serious counselling to the rest of the main bridge crew. They always, they don't really seem like they need it somehow. You, you feel like whatever they go through, they're just going to bounce back, just like uh, Captain Kirk bounced back from everything in the original series. You know, do they ever really need counselling in a sense? And I guess, you know, some of the so the sessions that we see you know, yeah, we we see her dealing with, for example, Barclay's phobia and she teaches him a few tricks that, you know, I mean, I mentioned I have a phobia of flying. I've, I've tried everything to, to help with that. They remind me of like um, some of the tricks that Paul McKenna might, you, you know, have in one of his, his books or his CDs or something, this plexing technique, you know, all these kind of slightly, you know, yeah, you'll try them and they might help a bit or whatever, but it's slightly dubious kind of psychological techniques, maybe. They, they don't present her in a particularly kind of serious light, I don't think, as a as a therapist. Often. So, so, so there are some good moments, but certainly given that she's one of the key characters for seven years of this series, it definitely feels like this is something that they're kind of underselling in a way in Next Gen. Yeah. I, I, the one thing I do really like about her, though, is that she's kind and she is empathic. And I don't mean empathic in just the sense that she's an empath, you know, that has that little supernatural ability. But I mean that she also is a kind person. And I think, but I don't see that as something that necessarily is like part of her counseling duties. I see that as something that's part of her personality, but then you can't under, you can't underestimate like kindness when it comes to someone suffering, you know, when it comes to helping someone who's suffering. I think in terms of Barclay, I hadn't watched the episodes of Next Generation that are focused on Barclay, you know, those two particular episodes. I hadn't watched them in quite a few years and I watched them in preparation of this episode and I was horrified. <laughs> I was horrified at the way he is treated by the Enterprise crew. And, you know, these are people, these are characters that I, I love. You know, I love 
Picard and I love Riker and I love Geordie and Data and I look up to them, you know, I think they're, they're essentially very good people. But I sort of felt like good mental health is just kind of assumed on the Enterprise. And whereas it's not assumed necessarily in Deep Space Nine and definitely not in Voyager. And I thought it really was just assumed um, in Next Generation. And you've mentioned this before in podcasts that the crew of Next Generation seem like these super people, you know, they're incredibly intelligent and incredibly good at their jobs. And the Enterprise itself is like this amazing floating hotel, you know, so it is kind of like everything's good and great. And obviously there are some episodes that are different, you know, Picard does suffer from PTSD after, or, tr- you know, or trauma after, after being a Borg and all that sort of stuff. But, and he is tortured, you know, and he tries to, he has to, he's seen talking to Troy after the fact that he's tortured by the Cardassians. But it, a lot of the time they seem to just kind of be really competent and, and they also seem to be really functioning at a, at a high level, you know? So Barclay does completely contrast with that because he's someone who's too frightened to go into the transporter he's someone who's late for work he's someone who although is actually quite brilliant in terms of his subject matter you know he's he's a good engineer he is uh, you know not really um proactive when speaking up in meetings or giving his ideas or suggestions and it's something that Geordie doesn't seem to understand you know, like, why doesn't he, you know, why doesn't he say something? Why doesn't he, you know, I, I, I thought one of the most offensive things was when Barclay was trying to explain to Geordie uh, in 10 Forward about his social anxiety. And Geordie was like, you're just shy, you know? And I, <laughs> I was like, oh my God. It's like when somebody's clinically depressed and, the, you know, and I've had this, oh, Gina, you, know, you just need to think positive, you know, and you're like, oh my God, you totally don't get this. You don't get this at all. And and you're not really making an effort to get this because, and you know, I know you're trying to make me feel better, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're trying to make yourself feel better. I don't know. I felt like part of it was that, that Geordie and Riker were just un- unsympathetic to him, basically. And he's obviously talented, but people don't always look beyond his anxiety and his confidence and emotional problems to see that he's talented. And as soon as he's given a little encouragement and a little bit of praise by Geordie, he actually gains some confidence. And to think that Geordie is a boss, Geordie's a manager of people, right? And he doesn't know that, you know, that was kind of a shock to me. And and then also hearing Guinan, obviously Guinan's the most sort of empathic person in that episode, but in a realm of fear, like Troy, Troy doesn't seem to understand Barclay's phobia initially. She sort of asks all these questions and investigates it, which is what a counselor would do, I suppose. But she also emphasizes that his phobia, you know, is, I mean, she does say it's not irrational, which I do think is, is a good thing because his phobia isn't irrational. Uh, uh, being transported like that sounds like an incredibly dangerous way to travel. But I think that, um, the way that, 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 you know, she gives him advice, the way that Miles gives him advice and Geordie gives him advice is, is, is sweet and it's kind, but it's a little bit misguided, you know, like telling him that the transport is the safest way to travel doesn't really address the phobia. Do you see what I'm saying? It addresses the, like the, the, the logic behind like the safety of transportation. That's like me saying to you, you know, air travel is the safest way to fly and then quoting statistics at you about how it's the safest way to fly and you're sort of thinking well actually that's not really helping me in this moment yeah because i know that already <laughs> you know it's yeah, like, I know, yeah and it hasn't actually helped like, it hasn't made me less so rationality doesn't always work when getting rid of phobias you know and yeah and i think like you were right when you said that essentially sometimes his character is used for comedic effect when really it shouldn't be because anxiety and phobias aren't actually funny mm. I think that's definitely a, a, a problem in a way is that Barclay is intended essentially as a comedic character and, and yet he has all these kind of neuroses and kind of psychological issues that sort of are played, you, you know, at least in part for laughs. But I also think it's just an element of the way the different shows are written. I mean, if you compare, for example, the treatment of Barclay's phobia in Next Gen with Garrick's phobia in Deep Space Nine, and, you know, I wouldn't say that Esri Dax is a better counsellor than Deanna Troy, necessarily. 
I, or at all, probably. <laughs> I mean, you know, insofar as she seems very inexperienced and like Troy at least seems like she's been doing it for a while and she knows what she's doing, you kind of trust her. But the way those episodes are written, the DS9 episode, After Image, is much more interested in the kind of psychology of Garrick's phobia. Garrick is suffering from claustrophobia and we understand it as a mixture of this kind of guilt, which Esri actually diagnoses quite, you know, astutely that there's that he's suffering from an element of guilt because he's providing intelligence against the Cardassians and therefore, you know, his own people People are dying as a result of it. And also there's an element of childhood trauma that his father used to shut him in a cupboard or whatever when he was a kid. So there's this kind of association with his traumatic memories. You know, so Garrick's phobia is totally explained in psychological terms rather than, you know, and in, and in quite sort of gritty you know, sort of getting in there somehow, getting into his psyche a bit. Whereas I feel like with Barclay, we don't really ever get into his psyche. His psyche is just presented as this kind of ridiculous mess that is kind of there. And, you know, well, we're going to try and sort of work around it somehow. And I don't think the episode Realm of Fear is as interested in the kind of psychology of phobia in a way as as, as, as Deep Space Nine is. And maybe that's part of the, the kind of problem more generally for Next Gen. But I think the other thing that you find in Next Gen is that, you know, it's not that mental illness or kind of mental, you, you know, I suppose in Next Gen it's often something more like sort of mental disintegration. If you think of something like the episode Frame of Mind, which arguably is a good, in, in some ways, or a very dramatic depiction of kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, of a kind of psychotic schizophrenic breakdown in a sense that that Riker appears to be suffering from and, and Jonathan Frakes does a great job of presenting that but at the same time of course it all turns out that it's just aliens experimenting on him and you, you know it's, it's all there's some kind of rational explanation really Riker was only going through all that because he was being affected by something and I think what you tend to see in next gen over and over again is you know there's a spatial phenomena that makes everyone go a bit weird or there's a kind of you know it, it, even to take it a bit more seriously you know when Picard's tortured by the Cardassian in chain of command and he gets to that point where he actually is is becoming delusional you know he says he could see the the the, the, the number what is it five he, he could see now I'm deluding myself and, and forgetting which it was is which. four lights. There are four. But he, could he knows see there five. are four, but he can yeah. see five. There you go. See, the, yeah. my my brain has completely uh, melted on the subject of how many lights there were. But you know, the fact is, he he kind of is is literally seeing something he knows is not true. So he is delusional, but at the same time, it's it's totally explained by the fact that he's being tortured and he'll get better and he'll be fine. You know, in the episode "Remember Me," it appears that Beverly Crusher is having some kind of weird paranoid fantasy where people keep disappearing and everyone's lying to her and nothing's making sense. In fact, you know, she has that line, doesn't she? There's, there's, there can't be some, anything wrong with me, so there must be something wrong with the universe. That's kind of almost the, the next-gen approach to mental illness, is it's like, you know, yeah, our characters are not going to be mentally ill. There's going to be, again, you know, shenanigans. There's going to be some kind of plot explanation. There's going to be some kind of spatial phenomenon, some kind of mystery that's explaining it. And that's usually the way that kind of next gen gets around these issues without really getting involved in the kind of, the, the, the sort of more difficult stuff of them somehow. And I think you see the same thing again with Enterprise. I mean, you, you know, Enterprise in many ways, I think is a sort of step backwards from DS9 and Voyager in terms of the things that they were kind of pushing as, as in terms of what Star Trek could deal with. And again, when it comes to mental health, I think Enterprise feels much more in the kind of next gen mold, you know, we've got all these episodes. There's the episode Singularity, for example, where they go too near to a black hole or something and, and everyone starts behaving weirdly. And, you know, one character's kind of got OCD and someone else has got some other problem. And, you know, they're all manifesting these kind of, you know, sort of mental health conditions in some sense but it's very clear that it's all being it's being caused by this kind of spatial phenomenon it's not really it's not being caused psychologically it's not coming organically from their own life experiences and their own you know oh, psychology. do you mean night do you mean the episode night no, that's the Voyager episode, which, you know, arguably oh, you could, sorry, you, okay. which is interesting because you, you could say that's the same thing that's happening there. No, I'm talking about the Enterprise episode, Singularity, where um, oh, I think it's a black hole that's having, oh, yeah. that's having that impact. We, I guess we do see an Enterprise Archer having the kind of fallout of the whole Zindi conflict. And he, he does have a little bit of a kind of wobble over that. We see a good example of bereavement with Trip. We do. Yeah. But then, yes. And that, and that is handled, I suppose, in some ways quite well, but, but it's very much in the mold of like trips angry trip wants revenge you know trip has to kind of let go of that and 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 kind of uh, come to be a bit more starfleet and a bit more kind of star trek and kind of you know move beyond that and you you know which is it's fine i'm not i'm not knocking that as a storyline but i don't know yeah you you do see it, but it, 
and it's also again it's like you know it's totally of, of, of course he would be you know distressed and traumatized by the loss of his sister it's a big kind of sort of plot point in a sense well uh, so an example example of when i one of the things that i thought of when i watched those episodes in enterprise was i actually before i'd watched that i'd watched the series battlestar galactica and the most recent you know the recent reboot of it and there is a lot of people suffering in that in that series partly because they've been forced to leave their planet after a massive catastrophic attack and which like millions if not billions of people have died billions of people really and so in a way you could draw parallels between the two series in the sense that the zindi attack on earth millions of people have died in primarily in you know the area of florida and then you could also say like in battlestar galactica billions of people have died on caprica and the way Battlestar Galactica dealt with it was quite different. And in fact, there is actually a character in Battlestar Galactica who does kill herself. And there are characters who are shown to suffer from PTSD and from depression um, and bereavement and a lot of mental health difficulties. And I mean, that's one reason why it's a good show. Uh, it's not as utopian. It's not as utopian. It's a different kind of show. It's trying to explore a different type of thing than Star Trek is. But sometimes when I do think about mental health in science fiction, my mind does turn to that series a little bit more than, say, for instance, Star Trek um, in terms of PTSD and big catastrophic events. Because there are a lot of big catastrophic events in Star Trek. And actually some of the sort of, I mean, I mean some of the really bad ones do happen in like Enterprise and in Next Generation, you think about the Borg. I guess you do see it in First Contact. I mean, Jean-Luc Picard does kind of lose it, doesn't he? Yeah. And I guess it's 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 noticeable that First Contact comes, you know, really in the time when DS9 and, and Voyage, it, it's, it's more, it, it's sort of out of the next gen, obviously the next gen movies are kind of overlapping with those later series. So in some ways, I think some of that comes from the, the sort of mindset of that time more than the mindset of when Next Gen was on the air, if you know what I mean. I mean, I sort of feel like you get you get the Picard in First Contact, you know, because it's around the same time that you can get, you know, Janeway retreating to her quarters. You can get, you know, the depiction. Um, well, Garrick maybe is a little bit later, but, you know, Belana Torres, for example, and some of the, the mental health problems that she goes through. It's sort of a time where you can kind of engage with the grittiness of, of things a bit more in that way. And certainly in that film, they really kind of push it to the max, this idea of this kind of trauma and this sort of effectively PTSD that he's experiencing because of it. Yeah, it's definitely shown as being um, an after effect of what happened to him in the Borg, w- with the Borg, because the, right at the beginning of the film, he has that, is it a nightmare? Or does he have some sort of like memory of a, a Borg implant kind of bursting out of his face? I think it's a nightmare, isn't it? It is a kind of um, nightmare and he, and he wakes from it and then he has, a, and it turns out he's still asleep, isn't it? It's a kind of, so it's a sort of double nightmare in a sense. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something that someone who's gone through trauma would experience. And yeah, it's quite, I thought, I think that's quite accurate. But in terms of like Deep Space Nine and Voyager, like, I do think they do it better than Next Generation and especially, especially Voyager. Uh, there's, there's definitely more exploration of, of mental health in Voyager. Yeah. Well, let's move on now to have a think about Deep Space Nine and Voyager. And I thought we could take these two shows together because I think, you know, obviously they were running concurrently. They were on the air at the same time, overlapping. And I think really, you know, between these two shows is when we see Star Trek really kind of engaging with mental health in quite a different way and engaging with it more seriously. And I think where we see more of the episodes where mental health is kind of dealt with in in more of a kind of nuance, more of a kind of interesting way in some ways. I thought we might just take different sort of topics rather than than doing the two series one at a time you might look at different topics you know and see how they're represented across those two series in in the cases where they are represented in both so i mean first of all we kind of touched on this before we've we've, we've hinted at it but obviously depression is something that we see very much with Janeway in the episode Night. And I suppose you raised an interesting point when you said when I was talking about singularity, was I actually, you know, was I thinking about Night, in that it is brought on by this kind of spatial phenomenon. But I suppose for me, it feels more psychologically grounded, partly because 
there is this kind of explanation of where this depression has come from, the fact that there is this sense of guilt associated with it, this sense of kind of responsibility for past actions and so on. It feels kind of psychologically believable. I think it, do- it doesn't feel like it's, it's just some kind of spatial thing that's affecting her. And also, I suppose, because, you know, yes, the, the style of space is kind of affecting several members of the crew. I mean, Neelix is having panic attacks, actually, as a result of it. So he's having a kind of anxiety, you know, episode in a way. But with Janeway and the way that she's behaving, it, it sort of feels like it's taken more seriously. It feels a bit more real. The fact that she's kind of retreated to her quarters, the fact that she's kind of cut herself off from the crew, you know, and I think it's always, it, it's always a bad sign, basically, in Star Trek, if the captain doesn't want to uh, occupy that seat on the bridge. We see it in Generations as well, where Captain Picard's just had that news about his brother and his nephew, and he basically relinquishes command to Riker, essentially, and, you know, walks off to his ready room and basically says, I'm not dealing with this. And it's always a bad sign when the captain is kind of um, stepping back from command in that way. Yeah, I I mean, I've read online that a lot of people didn't like this episode because Janeway withdraws from the crew and it seems out of character for her, someone who is so responsible and who is a very good captain and is, uh, is sort of in control of so well, it's not control, but is responsible for so many people's lives. The fact that she would withdraw and sort of relinquish her responsibility to Chakotay to sort of run the ship on a day to day basis and kind of withdraw, like, with, you know, retreat from contact with other people but I actually really like this episode and I like it for several reasons I think it's really good at portraying a person who is a strong leader suffering from depression feeling the strain of being responsible for so many people's lives it's really good because I guess in my mind I see the novel mosaic as as canon and I saw I, I actually sort of see Janeway as someone who has suffered from depression before and maybe has a tendency to suffer from depression because of the things that she's gone through and because she is such a well Tuvok sort of explains that she does take risks because she feels so responsible for people like she's a very oh what's the word like she's a very conscientious person you know so she's very so, altruistic I mean, person as well isn't she altruistic I mean, yeah, yeah. and the thing is sometimes being conscientious and altruistic can lead you open to like feeling responsible for the suffering of others, you know, which can lead to mental distress. So I I sort of feel it's very in keeping with her character. And I like like the idea that she's living with the sorrow on a regular basis, but it's the void that brings out the actual depression. And I like the idea that the void does make people depressed because there's this idea, especially in Western world, that mental health is very much influenced by yourself, you know, like you're in control, you know, like you, you have a predisposition to being anxious or you have a predisposition to having some sort of mental health condition uh, without taking into account all the surrounding factors like a very difficult workplace or like, for instance, um, a lack of light, you know, in countries where it's, it's dark for a lot of the winter or like, for instance, too much light, you know, in the sense that people having, I don't know, like phones in their bedrooms and not getting the right amount of sleep, that kind of thing. Or the thing that I really suffer from is extra sort of noise pollution, I would say, in the fact that I live in a very urban area, you can never get away from noise pollution. And there are studies that show that noise pollution and background noise does actually affect our well-being and can exacerbate or um, impact on mental health. So, I think the void is a perfect example of that. It's good that it makes everybody more tense and snappy with each other. It's good that it inspires, uh, sort of provokes anxiety in Neelix and depression in Janeway because we are affected by our surroundings, you know, and that's why it's important for society to try and make those surroundings as conducive to our well-being as possible. And you'll find that actually in lots of countries, <laughs> in lots of societies, that's not something that people take into account when um, urban planning. So, <laughs> and so, so I feel a little bit like that's an example. I'm not sure that's what they were trying to do when they wrote that episode. I don't think that's what they were trying to do at all. But it, that's what that's what the episode said to me was that actually your surroundings can have a massive impact on your mental health, and that Janeway may always carry this sort of guilt with her, but that it's something that kind of came out much more when, you know, when she, when they went through the void in a similar way that Garrick's phobia, claustrophobia came out. He carries it with him all the time, 
but it, it comes out and becomes exacerbated when he's under periods of stress or when he's feeling a certain emotion. And I think that's very realistic. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it, actually. And I, I suppose the answer is that there's often a kind of interaction of different things going on that, that you know, causes um, someone to experience a period of poor mental health or whatever. It might not be all, you know, one thing or another. So with Janeway in that episode, it's a kind of combination of things. It's interesting that you mentioned Mosaic. For anyone who hasn't read the novel Mosaic, first of all, go out and read it. But secondly, just to kind of put that in context a bit, I mean, we talked a little bit about what happens to Janeway in that novel in our episode about impossible choices. And basically, she's put in this terrible situation. This is a massive spoiler, so don't listen if you are going to go and read it. She, she ends up trying to save both her fiancé and her father and and they both end up dying, which is obviously a deeply traumatic experience for her. And what happens in that story is two things. One, she becomes very depressed. She literally goes to bed for months on end. And it takes her sister in the end to get her out of bed by, in kind of classic Star Trek fashion, and this is something that will come up in a few of these stories that we look at, the kind of tough love approach to mental health, which I'm not sure is actually necessarily always the right course in real life, but certainly on TV seems to be the way that you deal with someone who's suffering poor mental health is that you kind of force them to, you know, to deal with it, to confront it one way or another, to kind of move on. Her sister basically throws a bucket of water over her and says, well, you're not going to sleep in that bed now, you know, come with me, we're going for a walk, and kind of gets her out there and, and out and about and gets her sort of back from this depression. But there's also this sense that in that novel, she has repressed the memory of what really happened because it's so traumatic that she kind of can't cope with it. And part of the story of the novel is her kind of reaccessing, in a sense, those kind of suppressed memories, again, in a sort of very kind of Freudian way. But but certainly there's this sense she's gone through a deep depressive episode, you know, and her sister says to her, you know, we've lost people as well. You know, I've lost my father. Our mother's lost her husband, you, you know, but it's Janeway who is really suffering this terrible depression as a result. She's not just grieving the loss of these two people. She's, you know, she's really struggling. She's lost a lot of weight. She's very, she's suffering a lot from kind of intrusive thoughts about what's happened from her memories. She is traumatised, you know, she is suffering from a kind of PTSD of it as well. But definitely, you know, this this sense of this woman who takes to her bed for a long period of time, for several months at a time, again, feels very much like it's kind of, um, you, you know, it is a kind of major depressive episode. I, actually, I... I, I Pulled up uh, when we were researching this topic a copy of the um, the DSM, the like it's the American kind of manual for dealing with uh, various different mental health disorders and so on. Because I thought they might be useful, uh, and it was quite interesting looking at the at the entry for depression because I think it it relates interestingly to to what we see about Janeway and also particularly to what we see with Belana Torres in Extreme Risk. This is I'll, I'll just sort of read through a little bit of the kind of the definition. The essential feature of a major depressive disorder, a major depressive episode, is a period of at least two weeks during which there's either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in nearly all activities. Changes in appetite or weight, sleep, psychomotor activity, decreased energy, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, difficulty concentrating or making decisions, or recurrent thoughts of death or suicidal ideation plans or attempts. Loss of interest or pleasure is nearly always present, at least to some degree. Individuals may report feeling less interested in hobbies, not caring anymore, not feeling enjoyment in activities. Activities that were previously considered pleasurable. In some individuals, there's a significant reduction from previous levels of sexual interest or desire. Appetite is usually reduced, and many individuals feel they have to force themselves to eat. All of those things, I think, well, maybe not all of them, but a lot of those definitely you can see in, in the way that Belana Torres is presented in the episode Extreme Risk. But I was quite interested, there's a, there's a special section in there about the role of guilt in depression, which I thought was particularly relevant for Janeway. And it says a sense of worthlessness or guilt associated with a major depressive episode may include unrealistic negative evaluations of one's own worth or guilty preoccupations or ruminations over past failings. And that absolutely is what's going on for Janeway. She's kind of stuck in the past. In a sense, she's stuck at this point where she made this decision four years earlier that stranded Voyager in the Delta Quadrant. She kind of, she can't get beyond it in a sense. In the same way, I guess, you know, when we were talking about bereavement, obviously Deep Space Nine opened with the captain in a state of, in a sense, poor mental health and this idea that he couldn't get beyond the death of his wife. You know, the prophets are saying to him, why do you exist here? Why do you exist here? This is, it's not linear. This is the past. You're supposed to have moved on. And I guess for Janeway, that's part of the problem is, is this inability to move on, which you see in Mosaic, where she literally can't get out of bed and kind of move on with her life. And you see a night where she's kind of dwelling on this decision that she made four years earlier. Yeah, and one of the things that I think I actually liked about, um, I guess it's not so the same sort of thing with Cisco, but what I really liked about 
J- uh, Janeway in in Night, and what I really liked about Torres in Extreme Risk, and I particularly liked the episode Extreme Risk as well, partly because. For me, it seemed to be a very realistic representation of depression. So hiding away from people, all the things that you've just mentioned, but also this sort of blankness. And I think in the past, rep- depression has been represented in popular culture as people, you know, sobbing like dramatically. And uh, I think people think that's what they're going to see when someone's depressed, you know, especially in their family or their friends, they're going to see someone who is crying all the time or someone who looks visibly outwardly upset, but actually there's clinical depression, but there's also subclinical depression, which is like the start of clinical depression. Really it's, it's, it's the beginnings. And that can be people who are just sort of blank a lot of the time. And, and Belana is blank in extreme risk. Yeah. She's injuring herself in the holodeck and she's fighting and seeming aggressive in some of the holodeck programs, but the scene where she goes to see Neelix and he orders the pancakes for her from the replicator, she's just blank. She's just sitting there and she's just this, like, it's like nothing. She's just nothing. And she sort of, even in her conversations with Tom Paris, she just doesn't seem to show excitement, but she also doesn't seem to show sorrow either. And that's a big warning sign. That's a really big warning sign when people just sort of seem to show no emotion or no care for something. Then, and and actually the, one of the most fantastic scenes in that episode is when Janeway confronts her in sick bay and she doesn't seem angry and she doesn't seem sad. She's just maybe slightly defiant because that is Balana, but she seems, yeah, again, very kind of calm and just not caring and it's Janeway who's the most emotional person in that scene like you know Kate Mulgrew does a brilliant brilliant job of acting in that scene because she starts to have tears in her eyes she's upset she's worried about Balana and she's she's upset for her and Balana's just not really reacting emotionally and then obviously when Balana says oh I don't care about not being in you know not being in the in in the team to build this new shuttle then Janeway's like, okay, now I know there's a real problem. Like, it's not just that you've been hurting yourself. It's that you're actually not interested in something that if you were well, you'd be jumping at the chance to do. And it's just, I just thought it was a really, really realistic ex- display. Um, or it was, a, I just thought it was a really realistic example of the beginnings of what can be a very, very serious depression if it went unchecked and no one noticed. Um, And one of the great things about that episode is everyone does notice. And then they start coming together and they start working together to try and help her. And I think Chakotay's way of doing it is maybe a little bit, I don't know if I necessarily agree with Chakotay's way of of getting her to confront it, but the fact that everybody notices is really important. And if you compare that to... Some, the treatment that Barclay experienced in the Enterprise in Next Generation. Although he's obviously not depressed, he's anxious. But you compare to how that treatment about how people don't seem to notice that he's really suffering from anxiety, whereas everyone seems to notice that Belana is there's something wrong with Belana. So I feel like the there's been development and progress made in Star Trek at that point. Definitely. I suppose it's also partly because we know her character, you know, we expect her to be kind of fiery and combative combative and, you you know, we have a sense of who Belana is and this is so different to her usual self. There's also that scene where Seven is kind of challenging her on something and she just doesn't really fight back somehow. And and even quite early on when they're first talking about the Delta Flyer and she's, you know, and and she makes this point later on, she says, I'm doing my job. You know, what do you expect of me? I, You know, I'm turning up for work on time. I'm, you know, I'll answer the question if it's put to me, but she's just doing the absolute minimum in every situation. And it is heartbreaking to see that kind of, like you said, that kind of flatness. And it is absolutely, you know, that, that is what it feels like. It's a kind of, you know, it's not that you're necessarily sobbing the whole time. It's not a kind of hysterical thing. It's a kind of, you know, from my experience, when I've, you know, suffered from periods of depression like that, it's more like a kind of, for me, it's like a sort of cool, a very sort of cool, quiet hollowness. Do you know what I mean? It's it's not something kind of showy and starry and kind of um, dramatic in that sense. And I think you're right. It's, 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 you know, it's very well done, that episode. It's very well performed by Roxanne Dawson and well written and very sort of sensitively handled overall. I think it's a really... Um, 
you know that and also what i like about it what i particularly like about the episode extreme risk is it's entirely grounded in the psychology of that character and in something that's happened to her there is no spatial phenomenon causing it there is no kind of external cause there's not even you know like like there was in night the starless space there's this is just something that's happened and this is it it's it's had a, a psychological impact on her it's you know it's had a, a very negative impact on her and she's not recovering from it in a sense and she does need her friends to kind of step in and help her and kind of get her through it in a sense and you know this is something that we see in other star trek episodes from around that time in you, you know in um deep space nine and voyager you know we do get this sense this is just something that can happen to people and these are not you know these kind of they're not like in the original series these strange mad people or whatever this is a member of our crew this could have happened to any of us you know in, in deep space nine we have you know, various examples, but one that came to mind is um, the sound of her voice, that episode where they, they're on the Defiant and they're all talking to this captain and, and the kind of, it's all about the relationships that they all have with her. And this is kind of deep in the Dominion War. And O'Brien, it turns out, has got very depressed. You, you know, not serious, not to the extent that Bellana is of, of, you know, risking her own safety and so on, but just generally feeling very down and kind of feeling like he's not sort of getting out of it and cut off from people and, and lonely and so on. And this is something that can happen to anyone, I suppose, is, is the sense that you get there and that it is something that, you know, their friends can kind of come around. They can kind of try and people will sort of try and help someone to get through it. And even in Deep Space Nine, interestingly, which I don't think you see elsewhere in Star Trek, there's an emphasis on the idea of medication as being part of the solution for that. So in the episode Hard Time, where O'Brien uh, is you know, pushed to such a he has this implant that gives him these. I mean, that is an example, I suppose, of a kind of sci fi you know, shenanigans causing the kind of mental trauma. But at the same time, it ends up feeling very real and feeling very kind of believable. And he ends up uh, trying to kill himself or on the point of killing himself. And Bashir says to him in that episode, you know, I'll give you some medication. It will help a bit, but you need to go and see a counsellor as well. It's, it's quite sort of, th- this is the kind of things that a doctor might actually say to someone in the real world in terms of how to kind of move forward from mental illness and the process that, that might be involved in kind of moving on from that. And again, interestingly, it's Bashir who mentions, I mean, obviously he's the doctor, he is going to mention medication, but he's the one who mentions medication in past tense as well, where you have that situation where there are people suffering from, you know, quite bad mental illness, kind of wandering the streets. And he sort of says, you know, this could be, these people could be treated, you know, there's medicine for these things, even in, you know, he says, even in in their time and, you know, even in our time, I suppose, you know, and they're not being um, treated properly in a sense. There's, There's sort of this idea that I suppose that rather than mental health being a kind of, uh, a sort of narrative thing that is kind of very ex- intense and exciting and then it kind of goes away magically, that it's something that requires some kind of treatment, whether that's counselling or, or possibly medication or some combination, you know, which is often what what people are given in, in the real world, that this is there's a similar approach, a kind of more realistic approach to how do we deal with this situation. I, it's interesting you should mention Bashir because I think Bashir is a good example of a doctor who really cares about the mental health of his patients. And I'm like, I'm not saying anything bad about Crusher. I feel like I should apologise to Amy again because I think she's a Crusher. She's a Crusher fan as well, isn't she? I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'm not saying anything bad about Crusher. But then, in a way, Crusher doesn't have to worry so much about the emotional distress of people when she has Troy on board. Do you know what I mean? And but I feel like ba- like Bashir really does care about the emotional just well-being of uh, of his patients, and he's expressed care about the emotional well-being of. Of Kira, he, he 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 you know is shown to express um, care about the emotional well being of Garrick, and and Esri, you know other other, other car- and, and definitely O'Brien. So he's an example of what a, a good clinical doctor should be like. Somebody who is seeing the mind and the body as two things that should be treated. Uh, together you know that, that you don't just treat the body you also treat the mind and that the two influence each other and can contribute to each other's well-being and and you know can also contribute to, e- to each other's diff- you know i mean like definitely if you're suffering from a mental illness you're, f- you're going to be physically affected and the same thing if you have some sort of physical illness you know it's it can cause mental distress so the two are very entwined and you can't really separate them and i feel that a lot of medicine in the past has been 
completely to treat the body and not the mind or to sort of deny that, you know, people say you've got psychosomatic symptoms. What they're saying is that, you know, it's all in your mind, but you're really, really feeling those symptoms. A panic attack is an example of that. People who are having panic attacks really feel like they're having a heart attack and maybe they're not having a heart attack, but it feels that way and their body is sort of replicating those symptoms. So it is something physical as well as mental. So I feel that Bashir is really, really good in that way that he sort of sees the two as connected. I think that if we're going to talk about O'Brien, we really do have to talk about the subject of suicide because there aren't a huge amount of examples of suicide in Star Trek, but the one that is most com- most you know in my mind is O'Brien trying to possibly trying to kill himself, like on the brink of killing himself in hard time, and that's a very exam- very good example of PTSD. Like if you compare that to say for instance what we were doing with Ash Tyler. That's a better example of PTSD. Also how trauma can completely and utterly, irrevocably, completely change your view of life. Like he starts sleeping on the floor, doesn't he? And he hides he hides food and all that sort of thing and then eventually does try to kill himself. And he also, it's, 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 you know, there's a progression there and it is, it is, again, it's noticed by his friends, you know, he's kind of lashing out at them. He attacks Quark. He, he, we find out he started skipping his counseling sessions. You know, it, the way that it's written and partly this is a testament to DS9's writers is that although there is this kind of uh, sort of gimmick about how, wh- where the trauma has come from, the, the kind of response to it feels very real. It feels very kind of grounded somehow um, in terms of the way that he behaves and the way that he, um, he's affected by it. Yeah, and right at the beginning of that episode, Bashir does actually uh, reference other things that he's gone through, which I thought was really interesting. Because, you know, we talk about episodic television, you know, somebody suffers from something one episode and then like it's never referred to again. And actually right in that beginning of the episode, in that particular episode, he does actually say to Keiko, like he's been through a lot and he mentions things that Brian's been through. And I thought that was really good. I was like, well, actually, he's what he's saying is that he's been through a lot and that stuff had an effect on his mental health. So we're going to have to expect that this is going to have an effect on his mental health. But he got through that, so he's going to get through this. Um, so I thought that was really clever, actually. Definitely. And I mean, it's interesting, you know, you, you brought up the subject of suicide. I guess, uh, you know, we have a similar similar storyline in, in some ways in Voyager with the episode Mortal Coil with Neelix. I mean, Neelix doesn't quite have the same trauma that O'Brien has, but he has this sort of more like kind of personal sort of religious trauma in a sense in that he is dead for a period of time and he doesn't go to, you know, to Laxian heaven as he expects to and he comes back very changed. And and I think, again, it's, it's handled quite effectively in terms of the way that he is is dealing with this kind of personal crisis. And you know, he says he feels like there's something missing. He doesn't feel like the same person, which I think is, you know, what it can feel like if you're suffering from poor mental health. You know, he he feels like he's he's not himself anymore and that he can't really get back to being the person that he was. And I suppose in a lot of these situations, that's, you know, really that's what it feels like. And that's where that kind of hopelessness comes from that might lead someone to think I'd be better off dead because, you know, I can't go back to who I was before. And, you know, for Neelix, it just feels like somehow that's that's not really possible for him anymore of course in the end you know he is sort of pulled back from the brink just as o'brien is kind of pulled back from the brink but you know it's another example of a character who's kind of yes he undergoes this kind of traumatic experience but then there's a sort of gradual uh, process of him trying to deal with it and, and not really being able to and one of the things i really like about that episode actually is you know you've talked about uh, how people, even if they're suffering from poor mental health, can still be turning up for work on time, can still be doing their job. They can be kind of masking it. Neelix is very much masking it in that episode. He's not letting in. He's not, he's not letting on to other people what he's going through. But the other thing that I like about it is even after the point where he's decided he's going to kill himself, and you talked about this earlier about the idea of, you know, the kind of calmness that that someone who's intended to commit suicide can feel. He He's still capable of being very kind and very considerate you know he has that conversation with seven of nine and he he tells her how valued she is and how he you know he's enjoyed getting to know her and so on he records this message you know his kind of suicide note in a sense i think and it's very much his kind of warmth of character his positivity and generosity of his character is is still there i mean it's it's very sad watching it you know thinking that he feels like he's lost something feeling like he isn't himself anymore because Outwardly, it seems like, uh, you know, a lot of what does make up his personality and the things that are kind of lovable about him and positive characteristics are still there. And I think it's good that you have an example of someone who's going through a very profound sort of mental health crisis, but they're not a kind of 
you know, he's not a sort of raving lunatic. Do you know what I mean? He's still him. He's very much himself going through this deep, deep turmoil, if you know what I mean. It doesn't stop him being Neelix. It doesn't stop him being who he is somehow. He's, he, you know, he's not totally lost in it. It's, um, it's something that's affecting him that he's, that he's dealing with. I, I was, because it's World Mental Health Day today, I, I noticed, um, I was looking on Twitter, Matt Haig, who's a writer here in the UK, who's written a lot about mental health, posted an extract from one of his books about depression. And it was quite a short extract, but he was basically just saying, you know, however big it can feel, depression is not bigger than you. You know, and you might think it's something outside you that's kind of consuming you, but ultimately it's within you. And that means that you're bigger than it and you can you know, you can deal with it. It's, 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 it's smaller than you think it is and sort of trying to recognise that. And I suppose that's one of the things that when you're in the grip of something like this, it can feel like it's expanded to fill the whole world somehow. It can feel like the whole world is a terrible, unsafe, dangerous place or whatever, uh, rather than it just being something within you that, you know, needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I think one of the great, well, one of the best things that somebody ever said to me, and this was actually a medical professional once, which was many years ago, he, uh, this uh, guy said to me, you must remember that your thoughts have no effect on the physics of this world. So you, you may think there's a cup on the edge of the table and you may think it's going to fall, it's going to fall, it's going to fall. But you thinking that, however much you think it, isn't going to make that cup fall. Because the cup is affected by physics and your your thoughts aren't, you know, you're not supernatural. You know, you can't imagine the plane falling out of the sky. You can't imagine a loved one dying and then it happening. You know, you, your, your thoughts don't have an effect on that. Uh, similarly, like your thoughts about yourself and your thoughts about the future and your thoughts about the world doesn't necessarily mean that that is what the world is or that is what you are or, you know, that that's what the future will be. And so, and that was something that, like, I know it's kind of something that comes to people a lot. Like, people probably obviously logically think that way a lot of the time, but it's like no one had ever explained it to me. And as soon as he said it, I, I sort of felt this like, okay, that's something I can go back to, like a safety net. I can go back to every time I'm feeling bad, I can say to myself, these bad thoughts are only in my own head, like Matt Hay was saying, and that I, that they don't, they're not actually going to affect the real world around me. And that they don't have to affect the real world around me. Of course, that doesn't thinking that thought doesn't cure you, but it did bring me comfort in some of my worst moments. And I think the thing about Neelix is that, I don't like I would say the same similar thing with me, is that Neelix has this interesting, fulfilling, and um fantastic life on Voyager. The teaser of Mortal Coil shows how much he's loved by everybody. You know, he has, he has this family around him, this family that's replaced the family that he's lost. And to, every, to everybody else, he seems like this functioning, wonderful, like person who's bringing, who's bringing a lot to his community and giving a lot to his community. And there's no real indication because of how good he's hiding it that he's suicidal. And, that's quite often the case with suicide, which is that people don't know that person's suicidal until they're gone. Uh, I never would have yeah. assumed it. I never would have thought about it. And especially in the case of suicide, which is why, like I said, uh, this book that I'm reading is amazing. It's very, very distressing, but it's the kind of book that needs to be written because it's such a taboo and talking about it is such a, a stigma that nobody really wants to talk about it. But it is something that is should be discussed because the more it's discussed, the more you can help people who are contemplating that action or are actually heading in that direction. I think the thing mm -hmm. about, about Neelix is that his near death experience was traumatic, traumatic enough as it is, but it's the fact that he's just, he discovers this belief about the afterworld that he had may not actually be real and that belief, mm. that belief about the afterworld is what was keeping him from really kind of experiencing the sort of um, distress over losing his family. So it's like mm. he lost his family, but he's like, it's okay, I'll see them again in the, in the, in the great forest. And then that's, when that's taken away from him, that's really what makes him feel completely hopeless, which in turn, like you said, makes him feel like a completely different person. I did, there was yeah. a very, there's a very strange moment in that episode where he has to relive his death in the holodeck. 
Yeah, that was poor mental health planning on <laughs> Starfleet's part, if I and, ever saw it. You know? And Chakotay <laughs> no, no one really like, thought about that until it gets to that point. What's you know? wrong with you, And then Felix? you can see Chakotay sort of sheepishly thinking, actually, maybe this was not this a great a bad idea. idea. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's a really yeah. good episode. It's a very sad episode, um, but yeah. it's, it's a really, it's important one, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, maybe one of the things that these episodes of DS9 and Voyager sort of emphasise, which is important as well, is this sense that, you know, anyone can suffer from a period of poor mental health, you know, which in itself is kind of destigmatizing, I suppose, to to recognise that. And I've always thought it's interesting, you know, at literally pretty much the same time that that Voyager episode, Night, was being aired where Janeway is, um, you, you know, is, is hiding in her quarters, basically has retreated from the crew, you know, is having this kind of depressive episode. At the same time, Cisco is undergoing a, a kind of uh, sort of, you know, maybe not quite the same, a similar crisis in DS9. It's after Dax has died and he's left the station and he's gone off and he's sort of peeling potatoes and playing the piano in New Orleans and basically completely quit his life as well. You know, they've both basically totally retreated, sort of stepped off the bridge, you know, not in a position where they're able mentally to cope with the um, job that we expect them to do as the captains of their respective series. And I think, I don't know if it was just a coincidence that those two storylines happened to to kind of coincide, but I feel like it sort of says something in a way when Star Trek's willing to present that, willing to present its two captains essentially unable to do their job because of their their mental health at that time. Uh, And you could say, you know, Cisco is really kind of experiencing that kind of burnout that you know, was kind of always on the cards for Kirk in a sense, you know, he's been doing this very difficult job. He's kind of, he's, he's seen too much. He's kind of, he's reached the point that he, he, he needs to go and kind of have a break. But at the same time, you know, he has, he, he has reached a point where he kind of can't carry on anymore and he, he can't kind of handle it anymore in a way. And I always think with Cisco, there's also this interesting question that we have this storyline with Far Beyond the Stars and this kind of other personality of him, the Benny Russell character. And obviously what Benny Russell goes through, again, is he goes through this, you know, appalling personal experience of the kind of racism that he's subjected to and the kind of personal setbacks that, that go along with it and so on. And it's really heartbreaking storyline. But then Benny Russell ends up in a mental institution because he does have a kind of complete sort of breakdown in a sense. You know, we, that famous scene where he's shouting, it's real, it's real, it's real. And part of it is is Benny Russell essentially delusional and mad because, you know, he's, he's, he's sort of hallucinating Captain Sisko or Captain Sisko's sort of hallucinating Benny Russell. But at the same time, in, in Benny Russell's context, it seems more like it's a kind of, more of a sort of mental breakdown in a sense. And it ties in, interestingly, I suppose, with the character of Descartes. You know, if you've got Sisko and Descartes as these kind of two, the, the good and the evil of, of DS9, in a way, these sort of two kind of, central characters along that kind of axis. Of course, Descartes has the same thing. You know, he has this psychotic breakdown, basically, when Zial dies. And again, you know, it's very, it is very kind of dramatic. It is quite over the top. It is quite sort of flamboyant and so on in the way that it's written and presented. But again, I think compared to other storylines that we've seen earlier in Star Trek and compared to certainly how it could have been done, Descartes' kind of mental state is quite well handled you know there's this kind of there's this all this sense that he's sort of been trying to fake it we hear about the counseling that he's been having and so on and in fact you know i was looking just going back to my dsm mental health manual and looking at the the definitions of schizophrenia it it, it you know fit the way that Descartes' character in those is written fits a lot of these criteria delusions hallucinations um persecutory delusions are most common the person believes they're being tormented followed tricked spied upon Prominent delusions or auditory hallucinations in the context of a relative preservation of cognitive functioning and affect, which is absolutely what Descartes has. You know, he can kind of present himself, he can make an argument, he can kind of, he can sort of function essentially, but he's going through this, you know, complete mental turmoil where he's imagining that people are there, are they, they're persecuting him, they're mocking him, they're kind of ridiculing him. And, you know, I, I think as much as it's quite, like I say, there is a kind of OTT element to that episode, Waltz. It does really work as drama. It feels very kind of intense. It feels quite real in some ways. And Ducat's sort of, you know, l- l- losing his grip on reality in a sense. It is rendered in a way that feels, if it, is, it feels quite credible. I think it's quite well written and it's quite, and it's very well acted as well. Yeah, definitely. I also think it's completely makes sense for Ducat because he's got a very sort of 
overblown, but at the same time, really fragile, fragile ego. And he's kind of delusional almost in the beginning anyway of the series, like thinking that like he's sort of saved the Bajoran people from themselves, that kind of thing. So it kind of makes sense that as time went on, he would get like more and more delusional and that any sort of mental sort of psychosis that he has would start to become more and more apparent and emerge more and more. So yeah, I completely, yeah, you're right. It's very dramatic. It's done very dramatically. And then of course there's all the stuff of the power race, which kind of makes it all supernatural as well. You know what I mean? So that kind of stuff I'm not as keen on, but actually I found it quite believable. I kind of saw his character going that way, especially to do with Zial because he's so needy about Zial and Zial so much part of his identity. And he, it's like he, not like we discussed this in other episodes, not necessarily in a loving fatherly way, but more like, she represents something to him, you know? And so when she's, when she dies, it's like that part of his ego is crushed and, and he just kind of can't deal with it really. I think um, one of the, while we're talking about Cardassians, I'm really taken in by the fact that like, I was really interested in Garrick's mental health, especially with concerning addiction in the episode, The Wire. And that really is, I've always loved that episode. And I, partly because you get an insight into what well, it's the first time you ever hear that Garrick has a first name and you get an, in, you kind of get an insight into his character and his personality a bit more, but he's another person who puts on this sort of front, you know, and, but at the same time underneath it all, you do sort of feel it's actually suffering. And over time, as he learns to sort of trust the people that he lives with on, on the station, um, primarily someone like Bashir or, or like Odo, he sort of reveals more of his his mental anguish. And one of the things I thought was um, really interesting in The Wire is that he, you know, Bashir's trying to figure out why he turned on this device. Like, why on earth would you trigger this device if you didn't have to? You're not being tortured. And he sort of explains that living on DS9 is a torture. And yeah, he talks about the physical symptoms, you know, the fact that it's cold and everything's too bright. And But I thought was really good because they never talk about that really in, in, in Star Trek is not enough really that different environments might disrupt different species in different ways. But he talks about that, but he also talks about how everyone in the station looks at him with hatred. And he often pr walks around the station, pr like sort of pretending that he doesn't really care what anyone thinks. He cares what Bashir thinks, but he, he knows people despise him and it doesn't bother him. Right. But actually I think underneath it all, what he's saying is it does bother him. He doesn't like being hated by everyone that he lives, that lives around him. And so that's why he's, and why would you turn on that pleasure device unless you were feeling some sort of pain? So he turns it on and then he gets addicted to it. So it's like, it's almost like he wants to be happy, which suggests that he isn't happy, you know? So I thought that was quite interesting. It's an interesting parallel as well. I'd never really thought about it, but with Nog and it's only a paper moon, which is, you know, very much dealing with Nog's kind of PTSD from losing his leg in, in the conflict. But again, he, you know, he retreats into Vix. That's his kind of, that's almost his drug. That's his kind of addiction. And it's, and there is this sort of question of th that Vix in that episode is seen initially as being therapeutic. It's kind of safe space for him, but then ultimately it's kind of impeding his recovery. And it gets to the point where Vic has to say to him, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, you're not going to have this anymore. You can't, you know, you need to leave. You need to go out back into the real world. Again, again a bit like, you know, it's the kind of tough love. It's the same, exactly the same thing Janeway's sister does to her in Mosaic, basically saying you're not going to stay in your bed the whole time. You know, you're going to kind of be forced to um, get back out there. And with Nog, you know, I think it's not just PTSD. It's really kind of agoraphobia that he's suffering from in a sense. You know, he won't leave his you know, what is effectively his room. I mean, granted, it's a whole hotel because it's in the holodeck, but in the holosuite. suite, but it's a kind of, it's a safe space where it's all kind of controlled and, you know, it feels very homely to him. And he's terrified of the idea of going back out there, of going back kind of to the real world. And I suppose it's another, you know, aspect of the fact that these, these shows are able to kind of take these characters more seriously, even, you know, not the main characters, but characters like Garrick and Nog, and to write such interesting storylines around them and around their mental health. And I think, you know, often when we look at these kind of broader issues, whether it's like LGBT representation in Star Trek or, you, you know, these kind of broad topics, and we're looking at how the shows have handled them over the years, we end up saying, well, yeah, they could have done a better job or whatever. But I think certainly once you get into these kind of 90s series, Yes, it's maybe not it's always perfect, but there are definitely 
big, big improvements in the way that mental health is dealt with. Another episode that I was thinking of from Voyager is the episode Lineage. And again, I think Lineage is one where it sort of emphasises this kind of dual causation in a sense, in that, again, you've got something where there's a kind of long-standing psychological cause or something that someone's been carrying with them. So for Bellana, it's this kind of, um, you know, her own kind of emotional baggage about her parents' divorce and her, her, you know, her situation as a child and so on. And then there's the kind of immediate thing, which is that she's pregnant and she's, you know, they get this scan of the baby and they see that the baby is um, going to have these Klingon ridges and so on. But the other thing I think is quite interesting and and I, I'm curious about the writing of that episode, but I know it was written by a guy who actually trained as a doctor originally um, and wrote a few episodes of Star Trek that have these kind of medical storylines. And it made me think it must have been written by someone who has some experience of kind of perinatal mental health symptoms because, you know, people people talk these days a bit more about postnatal depression more than they used to, but maybe don't realise that actually, you know, it's a bit of a misnomer because first of all, it's not necessarily post. Lots of women suffer from mental health problems throughout their pregnancies that are connected to changing hormones and all these sort of things that affect your mental health quite quite severely in many cases. And also, you know, it's not necessarily depression. It can manifest as anxiety. It can manifest any number of things. And I would say, Certainly in that episode, as much as Bilana at the end of it, she says to the doctor, you know, no, I'm responsible for my actions. I don't want you to let me off the hook by saying that I was suffering from, you know, a hormonal imbalance or whatever he calls it, a chemical imbalance. The fact is, it seems to me you can't watch that episode and not take away from it. that That's kind of an element of the story that's being presented there. And that, again, I think is quite sort of forward thinking for Star Trek in the 90s to be, you know, really presenting a story about perinatal mental health and and doing it in quite a, again, very effective way. And I think as much as Bilana behaves appallingly in that episode in various ways, you know, you do sympathise with her. You have a lot of compassion for her and for what she's gone through and what's kind of brought her to that point and, f- and for what she's suffering, you know. And again, Roxanne Dawson kind of knocks it out of the park with this kind of very raw emotional performance that she gives. And, you, and absolutely, you know, the sense of the psychological complexity of this character who has all this sort of baggage and has all this stuff that she's dealing with in her life. And and sometimes, you know, it becomes overwhelming one way or another. Latent Image is an interesting example of, I would say, of actually burying somebody's mental illness. I, 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 the doctor doesn't have a mental illness, but what, what he has is a breakdown. I suppose he, he, it's, not, it's not a long-standing mental illness that he has, but he does kind of have a breakdown. He He's like, crippled by the guilt of the fact that he had he had to choose one person over another to save and one person died as a result so rather than kind of dealing with it the voyager crew kind of hide it and i i think that they do that because they need a doctor and he's the only doctor so they need him to function because they need him to do his job and he can't do his job because he's so crippled by guilt which i guess you're supposed to believe makes him second guess all his medical decisions which means he basically becomes paralyzed and he can't do anything but i'm not sure it was the best thing to do i know that i know i, I know that sometimes and I think maybe this is because he is a hologram. I mean, because if he was a human being, they couldn't change his programming, could they? And they couldn't like erase his memory. Although there is, isn't there some talk in Star Trek about how they can change memories and um, manipulate yeah, well, memories? Um, yeah. Doesn't Dr. Pulaski do it? So it is possible. But yeah, yeah. it's an interesting point. You, they, they Clearly, they wouldn't really consider that on the human beings. There is this element that it's because they see him, you know, Janeway sees him as kind of equipment as much as... A person, but I think you're right. It's interesting as a sort of allegorical way of looking at how people deal with mental health in others. You, you know, buck up, stiff up a lip. You know, pull your socks up. Kind of. Do you know what I mean? It is almost that approach. It's like, okay, we're not going to engage with this. We're going to kind of skirt around it and get back to normal. And then you're right. It comes back to bite them because it comes back. And ultimately, the lesson that they have to learn in that episode is it's difficult and it's painful and it's hard work. But they actually have to sit with him through that experience and get him through it. And he will get through it. And that's, you know, what we understand by the end of the episode, although we don't quite see it. But it takes, you know, weeks of people sitting in that cargo bay with him, kind of raving, basically, and giving the time and giving the kind of kindness to sit with him and try and talk to him and try and sort of just be there for him. And I suppose in a way that, you know, that is a very positive lesson to, you know, for Star Trek to present really that when someone's going through a 
a difficult experience mentally, maybe that's that's what they need. They need someone to be there and to be patient and to, you know, be willing to put the time in and to kind of, you know, not leave them on their own and not not tell them to just, you know, sort it out or reboot the program or whatever it is or look for a quick fix solution. But ultimately, what the doctor needs is time to kind of work through what he's been through. Yeah, one of the things that's really struck me as interesting about, well, that goes exactly back to what I was saying, which was, you know, people who are depressed being told to think positive. Just think positive thoughts, you know, like, you've got to be positive. That's like, it's almost an impatience, isn't it? Like, can't you just get over this quicker, please? You know, and the thing is, people are human beings, and they they can't get over things that quickly. Like, we're not machines. And uh, actually, this is kind of ironic, because the doctor is kind of a machine. But he's, he's, he. In Voyager, he becomes a human, doesn't he? He's like he he develops enough to the fact that he becomes a human being, and and so he's more than just a hologram now that they can just manipulate. He has to be able to be allowed to sort of process his feelings like a human. When I rewatched that episode, I was uh, more recently. It was after I'd read this really good book, which I would really recommend to everybody out there, which was written by a um, a junior doctor, although he's now a comedian, called Adam Kay. And he wrote a book called This Is Going to Hurt from the point of view of his, uh, well, basically it's a diary of when he was a junior doctor. And it's really, really interesting. And I don't want to spoil the book for anybody, but he does talk about the the effects that being a doctor has on your mental health, basically. And there is a, there's one thing that happens in the book that is very, very upsetting. And you know, he's not completely responsible for it. It's, we're not talking about, you know, malpractice or anything. This is just something that goes wrong to a patient and has far reaching consequences for that individual, for the patient. Um, and it has, it, it, it's just, it's just bad luck, really. But it, it goes wrong while he's in charge and it goes wrong while he's in charge of other doctors. And, you know, he goes home and he, and he cries. And then he's expected the next day to go to work and just kind of like put it behind him. And one of the things that he says in the book is that that's kind of what's expected in the NHS is that people go in and they deal with these very difficult situations, these very difficult decisions that will affect somebody's life and not just their life, but the lives of all the people who are related to them, everyone who knows them too. And if things will go wrong, they can't always go right. And you'll have to actually be witness to those people suffering. And then you'll just have to kind of like deal with it and actually kind of like not let it bother you because you've got to move on to the next patient and the next day in the hospital and the next shift. And what he was saying was that sometimes it's not possible to, to do that. And the doctor is a perfect example of that in Star Trek Voyager. This happened to him. He made it, he made a medical decision, whether it was the right one or the wrong one. You know, you can't, he can't possibly know, like he was sort of saying in the episode. But the fallout of it is so distressing and so permanent. You know, this like Starfleet, you know, ship crew member is dead. You know, she's that, that, and that she's as a result of his decision. And so the trauma just can't be wished away. Do you know what I mean? And I thought, I thought that was really, really excellently portrayed and really well written and really well acted. And it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. You should talk about the NHS and kind of failures of, of of care in a way. I mean, we could, I could fill a whole other podcast with my thoughts on how mental health is handled in the NHS and the things that we're, you know, maybe occasionally doing right and the many things that we're doing wrong in terms of the the you know often the calculations are obviously being made about what's the cheapest way to treat someone. What do we class as urgent? You know, what who, where, where do we put our limited resources and how do we deal with these kind of issues Uh, but we've talked a little bit about you know sort of substandard mental health care as presented in Star Trek and times when you know maybe people don't get it right but of course I don't want to underestimate the extent that it can be difficult to get it right and you know for anyone who's had a a loved one or someone they're close to going through a mental health um, difficulty or, or crisis or whatever you know, it can be difficult to be the person in that situation as well and to know what to say and to get it right. And you don't always do the right thing. And it, you know, it can be hard to be patient and to kind of, you know, to give that person exactly what it is that they need. Because, you know, when someone's suffering in that way, it it has a real impact on their friends and their family. You know, they may be lashing out at them like Chief O'Brien. They may be, you know, behaving strangely or, or, um, you know, causing difficulties in their interpersonal relationships or whatever. And it does put a lot of strain on the people around them. And, you know, that can, 
that can make things difficult, you know. So it's, it's, it's easy to say with hindsight, yes, well, they should have said this or they shouldn't have done that. But I, I just think maybe we should sort of recognise that, you know, even people with the best will in the world can find it difficult knowing how to support someone in that situation. And, you know, it's good when if Star Trek can uh, give positive examples of, you know, of, of, of what people can do that, that may genuinely genuinely be helpful. But, you know, it's it's tough. It's tough on everyone. If you have someone who's going through something like that, it doesn't just affect them. It affects everyone around them, really. And as we see in these stories again and again in Star Trek, you know, we do see their friends, their family and so on kind of stepping in, trying to help, you know, getting pushed back, getting hurt in the process, whether it's, you know, Jake Sisko getting Nog shouting at him or, or you know, Bashir putting up with O'Brien being very angry with him or everyone dealing with Bellana's anger or or whatever. But, you know, they, they persevere with it and they do their best to help those people because, you know, they are part of their family, part of what we were talking about at the very beginning of this discussion. One of the things that means people turn to Star Trek in, in times of difficulty is that sense of family and that sense of, you know, sort of uh, that, that, that these are people who will put themselves on the line for each other, who will help each other, who will do what they can to make others feel better. And I suppose that in itself is quite a positive message. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, I've been quite critical in this, in this podcast, but then I am quite critical of Star Trek. That doesn't mean I don't love it. It's part of my nature to uh, analyze and like, look critically at things that's and one of the reasons why I mean if I am looking critically at something it is because I love it you know so uh, but one of the things I would say is like maybe have a think is there any other sci-fi around this time or any other sci-fi genre franchise that is that is this big that has addressed mental health as much as Star Trek has and I don't think there is and I think so although Star Trek has fallen down and hasn't done it really well sometimes and you know has missed its mark it's also done it really well too you know it's also really explored mental health in ways that other sci-fi franchises haven't and I think that's really important because science fiction is all about dreaming of other worlds and looking to the future and, and 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 thinking about the impossible and you know sort of sort of being imaginative and creative and i think we should also do that when we comes to mental health i think we should envision a utopia where depression doesn't go unrecognized where suicide isn't you know um not talked about because people are ashamed of it or frightened of it where you know postnatal depression isn't something that young mothers have to cope with on their own where, where there isn't a lack of funding when it comes to mental health services in any medical system. So it, it'd be good to sort of, if you see, if you see a good example of a utopia, then you can kind of dream that and then you can start actually making that happen. And I think in a way, Star Trek is good at doing that. So it's good that they've done it with mental health too. And it's also about representation, isn't it? I mean, it is important to see these things on screen. And I think, you know, part of the reason that we thought it was important to have this discussion, part of the reason that we're doing it on World Mental Health Day is, you know, it's uh, in a small way trying to contribute to this destigmatization of mental health because it has been stigmatized for many years try and recognize you know mental health is as real as physical health you know it's something that you know ordinary people uh, live through and and you know the numbers in some way are, are helpful to to reiterate i was just looking on the mind website today one in four people in the uk will experience a mental health problem each year and if you go through the the figures for different things generalized anxiety disorder is 5.9 out of 100 depression 3.3 out of 100 phobia 2 0.4 out of 100, OCD 1.3, panic disorder 0 0.6 in 100, PTSD uh, 4.4 in 100, a mixture of anxiety and depression, which as I mentioned you know, earlier, often they come together in some combination or other, 7.8 in 100, so actually the highest of all of those. And also, you know, over the course of their lifetimes, 20.6 out of 100 people have had suicidal thoughts, 6.7 out of 100 people have actually attempted suicide, 7.3 out of 100 people have self-harmed, you know, and really just kind of recognising the extent to which, you know, mental illness is not something that just happens to other people. Do you know what I mean? I mean, people always say the same thing about cancer or whatever, all these things that we don't like to think about and that we think, you know, in that kind of original series mould, it's something that happens to other people away in that asylum where they're nothing like us. You know, actually, I think it's important, Star Trek showing us our regular characters going through this. 
and it reminded me a little bit, you know, talking about this kind of destigmatization and trying to kind of acknowledge mental illness as something that's that's real and that people live with. Talking about Star Trek, Will Wheaton has done a lot of positive work in that area. I mean, you know, go and look it up if you haven't read it. He he wrote a wonderful piece about his own battles with depression and anxiety throughout his life and the troubles that he's had. Uh, and, and has been a real advocate for mental health and for kind of sharing his own personal stories. And, you, you, you know, as, as he said, it's getting to a point where he's not ashamed to tell that story, not ashamed to be honest about himself and to kind of be open about it. And that that is something that is doing good, you know, both for him, but also for other people and for anyone who's experiencing those things. And so I think that's, you know, it's, it's important that Star Trek represents these things because, you know, talking about them is kind of what we need to do. Well, it's been fun <laughs> talking about mental health in Star Trek. <laughs> it's not particularly been fun, but it's always a pleasure talking to you, Clara. So it has been a pleasure <laughs> talking about mental health in Star Trek today. But that's not the only thing that we've been doing on the network this week. So here's a listen to some of the other things you might have missed out on on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Earl Grey. However, one thing Everyone's I do Everyone's la- going to sing the song, Everyone Join Me, Life. Life. No, I will not join you. I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay, however... Where are you? (laughs) Meta Trex. Speaking of character, I always found it interesting how many ways Q manifests himself, the characters that he takes on. We see him as a Starfleet commander, a Bajoran waiter. We see him as an alien captain. Uh, this this Q's is just a, man a cosplayer. Of many, <laughs> this is a man of many faces. Who knew Q is such a theater geek? The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. I felt like I was in a Vegas casino and the bling, bling, yeah. bling, like it <laughs> was the jackpot. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? How is she affecting the replicators and that's throwing food out? I've never seen a replicator throw food out. Melodic Treks. Well, it was definitely about a lower budget. There was no question that we could not afford Jerry Goldsmith. And later, by the time we got to do Star Trek VI, we couldn't afford Jamie Horner. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place is to join the larger conversation on the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type in Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture. That'll come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm. Primitive Culture is brought to you by Duncan Barrett and Clara Cook. You can find Duncan Barrett on Twitter at Barrett's Books. You can find Clara on Twitter at Clara Jean MC. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our special patrons' website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank our associate producers here at Primitive Culture, Tony Black and Amy Nelson. Tony was one of the founders of this show, and we still keep him in the loop about what we're doing. You can find him on Twitter at at AJBlackWriter, and online, hosting about a dozen other podcasts on everything from the X-Files to classic cinema. Amy is the host of two shows on the Trek FM network, Earl Grey and The Edge, and you can find her online on Twitter at at Miss Amy Nelson. You're blended all right.